Welcome this morning. Welcome to worship. I want to speak in the beginning here to maybe a minority. I hope, but I've I've come enough to church to know that sometimes you don't feel like being here or you come into this room heavy. And so this morning for someone that's here that has something weighing them down, maybe you can't stop thinking about your son or your daughter, maybe you're angry. Maybe you had a bad week at work. Maybe you don't feel well. And you haven't felt well for a while. Maybe you're upset with your spouse. You, I could go on. You know what you're carrying. But this morning, I want to invite you for one hour... To lay it down. Whatever it is, to lay it down for one hour and worship God. Your pain, your hurt, your concerns, your problems, they're going to be there for you when you're ready to pick them back up. They're not going anywhere. So don't worry about that. Lay it down for one hour and worship God. And while I'm only suggesting one hour, maybe, maybe there's more. It may be that you could just leave them laid down. You could leave them at the foot of Jesus, that you could trust Him with those problems, and that maybe you don't have to pick it back up. After that hour is over, you just lay it down for an hour and you see when we get to the end what needs to happen. But I can assure you of this, if you will lay it down for one hour and worship God, when you go to pick it back up, it's going to be a lot lighter. Amen. Turn with me to Psalms 103. I invite you to lay your burdens down this morning and to be fully present. And let the singing soften your heart. Let the Word instruct your heart. Let the teaching this morning encourage your heart. Let Jesus open your heart and let the Spirit keep your heart. Psalms 103 begins like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Can you say that with me? Bless the Lord, O my soul. He is worthy. And I think that it's important that we verbally acknowledge that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all His benefits. See, the thing is, sometimes these weights that we carry tend to cloud our minds and, our, and we, we do, we tend to forget the benefits of the Lord. And I would encourage you, someone asked me a question, I believe maybe Kidron's brother spoke on, on this and did a sermon on it, but it, it was, the question was, what has following Christ cost you? And that question was simply asked me this week. And I would encourage you to consider that this week. What has following Christ cost you? And what I found was, I hadn't even read this chapter, that was earlier in the week, but as I considered that, I began to consider the benefits 
God's benefits. Um, and I, I would just challenge you to consider that question. But, but it is important that we, that we recognize how blessed we are and how much we need Him. Who forgives all your iniquities. If you've been forgiven this morning, it's only through God. Who heals all your diseases. And some of you can testify to that in a physical sense that He has healed many diseases. We know that He is a great healer, but I believe this perhaps is speaking of a, of a spiritual sense. And, and he, haven't we experienced a healing of that disease of sin? It's only God who redeems your life from destruction and we can testify many of that of us of that of being on a road that led to destruction of being in a miry pit with no way out of being like Jonah on the ship ship that was sinking and you could go on but we were all headed for destruction but God redeems our life from destruction. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. And if you have experienced a change in your life, that you're able to love people and to be more tender, that only comes from God, who satisfies your mouth with good things. And I just picture this. We're getting ready to talk about a bird in the, in the rest of this verse. But, but I picture... Baby birds in a nest and their, their, their heads are pointed up and their mouths are open and they're crying out for food and the mother brings good things and puts into their mouth. And I, and I picture us this morning with our Father God and it says that He satisfies your mouth with good things. Are you looking up and are you crying out? Because when you do, he will. He promises when we ask that he will answer. When we seek, we'll find. He says he satisfies our mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He satisfies us with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now I want to go back to the previous chapter here in Psalms 102. It talks about three different birds. And I want to look at the contrast here. When God satisfies us, it says our youth is renewed like the eagles. That speaks to me of freedom. That speaks to me of strength. That, that speaks of a wonderful thing. But look at verse 6 of chapter 102. And this is a prayer of an afflicted man. This is someone who's overwhelmed, pouring out his thoughts and his complaints to the Lord. In verse 6 he says, I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. Maybe, maybe you feel like an owl in the desert or like a sparrow alone on the housetop this week. This morning I want to encourage you as we go to prayer, to open your mouth, so to speak, to God. And let him satisfy you with good things. So that your strength is renewed and you don't have to be a sparrow. It reminds me of the, the, the message that Paul Scott gave at conference last year. Fly, eagle, fly. You were made for more than scratching on the ground. If we... We'll look to God. He will satisfy us. He will renew our strength and we can soar above the problems of this life. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, he, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. I, 
I think we've used enough time. I'd, I'd love to just keep on commenting here. But I think to grow from a sparrow to an eagle and to leave the wilderness like that pelican and to soar among the stars, so to speak, like an eagle should cause any man to bless the Lord. This morning, worship God. What are your prayer requests as we go to prayer? I love the opening, the Sunday school opening this morning. I thought that was extremely powerful. The times in my life when I've been upset, worked up about things in my own life, and I've known in prayer and prayed for people in persecuted countries, people who are starving, people who, who have nothing, who have lost loved ones, and my, my selfish problems disappear so many times. It's just so small. To pray for others is vital for our own health. Don. Pray for Pat Landis and her, her family as she's passing on. John and Jenny in this evening service. Yes. Yes. Pray for Ukraine, the people there. Pray for Banks, Zeb's nephew that's in the hospital right now. Complications. Camille. For Dallas and Terry and their family. All right. Let's kneel in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We thank you for a place to come to gather with your people to worship you. Lord, this morning we do. We honor you. We invite you here. And Lord, we we ask your presence here. Lord, we, we seek your truth this morning. We just pray that you would be here and, and open every heart. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, for Jesus. And he came and he lived and he died and he rose and he did it all for me, for everyone here. Thank you for that hope. Lord, I just pray that we would live in that lively hope. I pray for the, the prayer requests. Lord, that I recall, I know that you've heard them, but I pray for Pat Landis and her family. And I pray that you would give them strength and comfort in this time. And Lord, we pray for, for Dallas and Terry. Pray for his continued healing. And we pray for Zeb's nephew. Lord, we it's about as hard as it gets to watch a child helpless and suffer and sick. Lord, I just pray that you would bring healing according to your will, Lord, and just pray that you would be exalted through every interaction through every doctor and nurse that comes in contact. Lord, that you would somehow receive your glory, that you would bring healing. Lord, I, I pray for the service this evening. Lord, that it would be pleasing to you. Lord, that, that you would be present, that you would make it um, into what you would have it to be, Father. I just pray for, for you to give wisdom and direction 
And Lord, that your name would be exalted. Lord, you know there's many more needs. And we pray for those in the war-torn countries something that we can't understand we've never experienced even remotely lord you're the only answer whether it's in war or in prosperity we all need you just the same and so i just pray that this week we would look to you Lord, that this week the people in Ukraine and Russia would look to you. And Father, you would be the strength for those who cry out to you. Thank you for each heart that's here, each person. And Lord, I just pray that, that you would lead, guide, and direct. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, that this would be a rally this morning. Father, to prepare us for going out into the world this week to be your missionaries, to be your ambassadors, to be men and women who represent you. Thank you for this time. Pray for Bart as he brings the message, Lord, that you give him clarity, power, your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you ever get so wrapped up in what's going on around this world that it brings discouragement? You ever get to a point where you even really wonder what the purpose of the church is in this world and where she's going and and like is this is the church falling apart? I mean, this world has just gone downhill. Well, if you're like I am, it can bring discouragement at times. This morning, I really just have one purpose. And that is to lift you up out of any type of discouragement that you may be involved in right now. And that we focus on the future of the church and where she's going, where she came from, where she's going. And that we not dwell on all the negativity that is around us, but that we focus on Him and our future with Him. I invite you to the reading of Matthew chapter 16. Because we will learn today that if you have renounced your sin of the past and that if you have embraced the Lord Jesus Christ by faith through His death and resurrection, 
that you are not going the same place as this wicked world. You are part of an entirely different kingdom. You are actually the called out assembly. God has something better in store for you and I and the church worldwide. And so where the world is going, and I say this tongue in cheek because we are in the world, but where the world is going is not where we are going. The called out assembly. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias, and others Jeremiah, and one, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. For I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should, know, should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. I find it interesting. It's really no coincidence that Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi. Some of you have been there. We had the privilege a few years ago to stand in this place And Jesus takes his disciples amidst evil. This, this place of Caesarea Philippi at the time of Christ was known as a very, very evil place. It is where they would rise up their Greek gods. In fact, you can see, I don't know if this pointer will show it. Those of you that have not been there, this may show it better. But they had carved out little speckled display windows all along this huge rock cliff. And they would place their Greek gods in those display windows. And regular groups, assemblies, would come on a regular basis. And there they would honor and they would uh, worship these Greek gods. This slide here shows a, an artist rendering of what it would have possibly looked like in the time of Christ. Again, I don't know if you can see it, but here are those carved out display windows. At that time, there would have been buildings right off to the left. Off to the left of this slide here, where you, you can't really see it, but in, in this rendering, you can see this cave and there would have been a building set in front of that cave. And that cave today just has water in it. It's just a, an open cave in the end of the earth. But they tell us at the time of Christ that this cave would have been boiling. With boiling water or possibly hot lava coming out of that cave. And this very place where we stood back at the time of Christ, was known as Hot Hades, or hell itself. Wicked people would come to this place 
to the very point of hell and worship their gods. Isn't it ironic that Jesus took his disciples to this place in the daytime, of course, when none of this evil worship was going on, and he gives them this message as he, as he looks at Peter, and he says, Peter, you are a stone. The word Peter means a piece of the rock or a small stone. And then I believe he pointed to himself and he said, but upon this rock, I will build my church and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is a picture of another church along the Sea of Galilee and I like this photo. It shows an old church, the primacy of St. Peter, and it's built on this solid rock. Upon this rock, Jesus says, I will build my church. And the promise is, the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you are discouraged this morning, let me just simply encourage you that you are called out, you are a called out people. You are part of an assembly that is not going down. You are part of a people group that has a forever future. This should excite us this morning. Again, don't be discouraged. Sometimes, I, I guess I feel like that one of the greatest tools of Satan in the church today is just simply complacency. We arrive at church on Sunday mornings, we say hi to everyone, and we leave. That's not really what church is all about. We should be excited this morning to be part of this people group. Because the church is not going down. Let me encourage you in that this morning. As discouraging as it may be, when we look around, the church is not going down. We claim this promise this morning that the very gates of Haiti does not have power to overthrow us and to take us down. You are the called out assembly founded on the rock Jesus Christ. The New Testament term is ecclesia. You know that. It's a Greek word. It simply means a called out people or a called out assembly. The Old Testament term, or shall I say the Hebrew word, is edah keol. And it's, it has the very same meaning. And that's what I want to do, at least for part of this message this morning, is to bring the Old Testament meaning of the word assembly and the New Testament meaning of the word assembly together in Jesus Christ. The called out people, the congregation. What does the church look like to you? What is your vision of the church? What how do you define the church? Through the years, there's been hundreds and hundreds of sermons on the church. There's no way to cover it all in one message. Sometimes we tend to focus on one area. Maybe we're discouraged because that area we think is sliding. Some denominations and some groups tend to emphasize a certain area. What does the church look like to you and how do you define it? We know that there's love in the church. In fact, the Bible says that that's how the outside people know us. Is by the way that we show our love one to another. We are a hope people. We are a called out assembly a people of hope, based on our faith in Jesus Christ. 
the Holy Spirit guiding us in our decision making and in our journey. Worship. These are just words, and I've, I've showed a couple of these slides here before. You may remember, you may not. These are just words that I have thought of that should be included in church, though it's not complete. It's based on our relationship, vertically, most of all with Jesus Christ, God through Jesus Christ, but also a horizontal relationship with fellow men, fellow believers. Praise, preaching, leadership, prayer, communion, support, the gospel. A church that isn't centered around the gospel is not really even a church. Baptism, the anointing, children, people of all ages. If you are young in the faith this morning, don't think of yourself less than those of us that's older. You are part of the church just the same. The elderly, fellowship, mission, the Word of God, the Bride of Christ, healing, community, service, prophecy, fasting, giving, belonging, salvation. The church is not salvation of itself, but we proclaim salvation. Family, singing, gifts, revival, and accountability, just to name a few. What does the church look like to you? How do you define church? I know there's been times in my life, eras in my life, where I have focused maybe on one or two of these words and other times other words. What does the church look like to you? How do you define it? You are the called out assembly. How should it function? What is your perspective of the local church where you attend regularly? And for most of us, that's here at Cornerstone. There are a few visitors that attend elsewhere. Or maybe if you're watching, you attend elsewhere. What is your perspective of the church where you attend regularly? And does it look and function in the way that you just defined it? Do you value others' perspectives? Or do you get discouraged when it doesn't line up perfectly with your perspective? How do others view your church? I don't really like this slide. This slide says what the church often looks like to the outside world. Some of this I got from Francis Chan, some of it I've got from some others, and some of it is from mine own experiences. What the church often looks like to the outside world, and this should be sobering. A lot of times others look at the church as hypocritical. In other words, we live different than what we preach. They say they just want everybody to get saved. And we would say, yes, of course. But they're saying that, they're saying that we have a bit of arrogance about that statement. The outside world says the whole church is responsible for the hurt that I experienced from a few people. And you know the statistics out there. There are a lot of people that used to attend church that don't attend church and a, a number one reason is because they experience pain and hurt from a few people. They may say it's all about their belief system. 
So our stand against abortion or remarriage or morals making it too political. They may say they don't accept each other. How will they accept me? The church is too judgmental, holier than thou attitude. I'll never be good enough. Most of us have heard this. They're too sheltered. They have no clue what's really happening around them. They just want my money. I just don't fit into their club. And I say, shame on us. Right or wrong, we can go down through this list, of course, and we can defend it. But right or wrong, this is the perception of many people, and it's real to them. We need to learn to overcome this objection. And there are many ways we can do that. One way is simply by loving and caring for them, speaking truth into their lives, and living out what we believe in truth and honesty. And I think this is probably the most powerful. Truly living what we believe. <clears throat> the concept of God's called out assembly started years ago. It is an old concept. Began in the beginning, creation, Adam and Eve. God created man out of dust. He first created the world, and then he created Adam and Eve out of the elements of this world. The ark, the calling out, and the saving of Noah and his people. The covenant with Abraham. Again, the calling out and commissioning. God gave Abraham a new name, a new nation, a new land. And then, of course, Moses and old Israel. The calling out of Egypt. He guided them by his word and his spirit he performed numerous miracles, countless promises, took them to Canaan land, and of course gave them the promise of eternal heaven. The concept of a called out assembly began years ago. What you are part of is not a new idea. What you are part of, brother and sister, those of you who have embraced the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, is an old story. God did not begin His promise to His people in the New Testament church age. And this is a, this is a, a misconception today. God did not replace the people of Israel with the people of the New Testament church today. This is one of my favorite photos. It's in a book of mine, a, a book about the tabernacle. And I'd like to spend some time and dissect it with you. But this, this uh, I said photo, it's an artist rendering. I don't think they had cameras back then. Um, uh, this artist, of course, you can see the tabernacle in the wilderness, backed up against the base of Mount Sinai. You've got the fiery pillar and the cloud that God led his people and all of Israel. We know the Bible says that that would have been at least 600,000 people. Uh, a lot of Bible scholars believe that it's more, depending on how that's defined. This could be said it's the, maybe the first mega church in the desert. God's called out assembly. God has always had a called out people in whom he made covenant with. And again, I go back and draw this thought just to emphasize to you this morning in 2022 that you are part of God's called out people. And this should bring an excitement to you, the very fact that this is not a new idea. But God has called you into this people group that He had established 
years and years ago. Again, the New Testament church is not a replacement of old Israel. But listen, it is a continuation of his congregation. And that's where that word edoch kehol comes in, that Hebrew word for congregation. Simply means a called out assembly. The New Testament church is, however, more complete because it is built, as we learned in Matthew 16, on the rock Jesus Christ himself, who is the mediator of this covenant, and we are empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Old Israel was called out and saved through faith in the coming Messiah. The New Testament church is called out and saved through faith in that same Christ who is, who came to die and rise again, giving us eternal salvation. Neither is there any, is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4.12 We, the New Testament church, are part of this eternal plan that God started years ago when He created us. We are a covenant people with God through Christ Jesus. You can turn your Bibles to the 12th chapter of Hebrews. Verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. 1222, but ye are come to Mount Zion and to a city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. And there's that phrase again, that brings the, the Greek ecclesia together with the Hebrew edah kehol, the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Verse 28, Wherefore we, receiving the kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. This is an eternal perspective. And this, this should bring excitement and encouragement to us. The word congregation, I've already mentioned, edah, simply means assembly, multitude, or company of people. We find it 149 times in the Old Testament. The word assembly, kehah, the assembly of God, or God's house. A Hebrew word. We find 123 times in the Old Testament. And then we read from Matthew 16. We could go to other passages. The word church. The New Testament church is built on Jesus Christ. It is the assembly of people called out by God. And continually seeking to follow Him by His indwelling Spirit. Ecclesia. The called out assembly. A New Testament term we find 80 times. These three words describe to us again that you are part of a called out people of God. I think it's in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 that says that you are a royal priesthood. A chosen generation. God has called you out to show forth His praise. Acts chapter 7 verse 38 it makes reference to Moses, and it says the church in the wilderness. Again, it's, it uses the word church in the New Testament because it's a Greek word, ecclesia, but it is referring to that church in the wilderness, edah, kehah. God has always had a people. The called out assembly is not a new idea. The word church is used to describe the called out assembly in at least three areas. Number one, God's people of all ages, the faithful dead of the past, those that are currently living, as well as the future saints who will yet be born. You can turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3.
Verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized unto Christ have put on Christ. Neither, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to to the promise. The church is made up of all individual believers today worldwide. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And verse 13, Till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man and to the measure and the statue, stature of the fullness of Christ. And Acts chapter 16 verse 5 refers to the local assemblies. So these three areas speaks of the global church, the current church today, and the local assemblies. Acts 16 5 simply refers to the apostles going through the land and establishing local congregations. Let's take a quick look at what the church is not as a cross-check. You know, as well as I do, the church is not the building itself. And I don't think we need to spend a lot of time. I think you all understand that. We, we have a nice facility here. We appreciate it. And sometimes I'll tell Lisa, let's go to church. That's really not a proper way to say it. We should say, let's go meet with the church. The church is not the building. Or I may say, do you have a church key? Wrong. The church is not the building. The church is not the style of worship. If there's a hundred congregations around us in this region, you would probably find a hundred different styles of worship. The church is not the style of worship. The church is not the leaders only. Sometimes we hear that referenced where the church says this or the church says that in reference to the leaders only. The church is not the leaders only. The church is not the organizational structure or written documents. That may, that may define what people believe in the local congregation, but the organizational structure and the written documents are not the church itself. The church is not a museum. You say, well, that's, that's interesting. All I'm saying is it's not based on artifacts. It's not based on preservation. It's not based on looking back. The church is a forward-thinking general assembly moving forward. And when we look, in other words, in Hebrews, it talks about running a race. We don't run a race going backwards. Our vision cannot be based on the past. Or really it's not even vision if you look up the word vision. Vision speaks of the future. The church is not a social club. I am probably as, as social as anyone in here. I love people. I love gatherings. I love fellowship. But shame on us if people think that this is a social club in which they do not fit in. The church is more than a club. The church is not our salvation of itself. And this sometimes can be discourage where discouragement can set in. Because people place their identity in the fellowship that they belong to. And when that identity fails them, they get discouraged. It is not our salvation of itself. It is, the church is not a vehicle 
that takes us to heaven. And you know some of the old songs about talking, talking about this ship Zion and uh, so forth. I, I, don't, I don't endorse them because the church of itself is not the vehicle. The church is the people that's on the vehicle. The vehicle is Jesus Christ. That's what the church is not to me. What is the church? Again, simply the people. The called out assembly. Which you are part of. It is a meeting place. And I'm not talking again. I'm not talking about the building or the land that this building is setting on. It is a place where our hearts meet with God's heart. A place of worship, a house of prayer, a place of revival, a pillar of the truth. And for clarification, the scripture calls the church the pillar and the groundwork of the truth. It does not say that the church is the truth itself, but the church holds up the truth. It is a pillar that holds up the truth. The church is a hospital. Bill talked about a little bit in the Sunday school opening this morning that we should be caring for others. And I appreciated that. It is a mission. It is a school where we learn of God and we learn of His Word. And I appreciate especially the young Sunday school classes where the young people and even the small children are learning of God. It doesn't just limit us to Sunday school but as we fellowship together, we are learning. We are a school, a fellowship, a called out assembly, a family. The church is a home. The, just the, the whole sermon could be placed on this one aspect. The church is a home. You think about all of the aspects that there are in a family. The sense of belonging. The father, the mother the fellowship, the supper time, the, the fun and enjoyment. The church is a home and a family. And it is an anticipating bride. This is not a complete list. You know that. Some things I came up with. What does the church look like to you? If you were standing up here and trying to define church, Let's run through a few thought-provoking questions. If you were all alone on an island, in desperate need of finding a church to fellowship with, and you crossed over a mountaintop, and you found just that group of people that you were looking for, what would that assembly look like, and how would it be functioning? That's thought-provoking, isn't it? Does the local assembly that you are part of look and function like that? And I ask these questions because sometimes we get our own perspective of what church really should be and what it should look like. And when it really doesn't line up with our perspective exactly, we can get discouraged. I've been there in my past. Is my life portraying what I expect the rest of the church to look like? In other words, is my expectations of others greater than that of myself? And I've seen this. I could tell you a story from years, years past. I won't even go there. But sometimes... Our expectations of those that we fellowship with can be greater than our expectations of ourselves. I like this definition. I'm not sure where I got it. I found it in my notes. Church. Imperfect people forming an imperfect family but serving a perfect God. We will spend a lifetime trying to figure out what church is supposed to look like, how it's supposed to function. We will never get it just right. 
We are imperfect people. Ultimately, it's not about us anyways. It's not about this building. It's not about the prettiest cathedral. It's not about the oldest abbey. It's not about Cornerstone Congregation or any other congregation. It's not about the Dunkard Brethren or any other denomination. It's not about the Anabaptist or any other movement. It's not even about the Universal Church at large. I've been spending the last half an hour talking about the church, and it's really not about us at all. It's all about Him and for His glory. The purpose for which God has called you out of this world. The Bible talks about Him calling us out of darkness into His marvelous light that you might shine forth that light, that you might bring glory to Him, that you might bear His image. I love the Old Testament study about God calling the children of Israel out that they would bear His image. There's a whole study on that. And there's application into our life today. How are you living? How are you looking? What kind of image are you proclaiming to others? Is it for His glory? And that can just be in little things. How you carry yourself. How you respond to others. The purpose for calling you out is to bear His image and to bring forth glory. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened by might, by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breath of length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Verse 21, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Amen. You are the called out assembly. If you find any discouragement in the world in which you live today, how the world is just falling apart, if you find discouragement in the time era that you live in today, let me remind you that you are part of a people group that is as old as creation, called out by God, and established on the rock Jesus Christ. Let me remind you that you are part of a people group as we read in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, that hell cannot overtake, overcome, or overthrow. Hell has no power over you. You are the called out assembly. You are the church of God, founded on the rock Jesus Christ. And hell cannot get to you. Let me remind you that you are part of a people group that is not going down. Let me remind you that you are part of a people group that is forever. You are part of the called out assembly, according to Matthew 16, 18. You are part of the caught up assembly, and I won't turn there, you're familiar with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it says that sometime the Lord is coming again. He will shout, a trumpet will blow, those that are in the graves will rise, and those who are yet living will be caught up together to meet Him in the air. You are part of the caught up assembly. 
this should bring encouragement to you. That, that chapter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 closes. The last verse says, Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. If you are discouraged in the time that you're living in today, get your chin up. You're part of the called out assembly, but you're also part of the caught up assembly. Praise God for that this morning. You are part of the coming down assembly. I find this, and this is the last scripture I'll turn to, but in Revelation chapter 21, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw John, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I don't know what kind of picture you get of that New Jerusalem. But really, as you read through those first few verses in Revelation chapter 21, the focus is not on the buildings, not on the city, not on the streets of gold. The focus is on the people, the bride of Christ. You are the called out assembly. You are the caught up assembly. And you are the assembly that someday will be coming down out of heaven into heaven, whatever that means. That can be exciting. I saw a new Jerusalem coming down out of God into heaven. And you are part of that futuristic coming down assembly. Be encouraged. The church is not falling apart, falling away, or falling down. Jesus took his disciples to this evil place, this place of the rock, it was often called, or this place of hell. Jesus took his disciples there to show them a, a very vivid picture that you are a called out assembly, the ecclesia, the church of the firstborn. And upon this rock, Jesus Christ, I will build my church. You are the called out assembly. Be encouraged of who you are, where you came from, and where you are going. Why don't we stand for a closing prayer? Father God, we approach you at your throne of grace this morning. We are ever so thankful for what you have done for us, that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light, that you have called us to be a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Lord, we just thank you that you are continuing to call people out of the kingdom of this world and into your kingdom, your eternal kingdom. And I just pray this morning if there are those among us who have not yet named the name of Jesus, that they will see in their heart today to repent of their sin and to embrace you by faith through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that they too can join in with this called out assembly and that we can live forever with you. I just thank you for the promises in your word. I too pray for those who are discouraged, those who are hurting in any way, those who need the touch of healing as we prayed this morning. There are many needs around us and you know every need. And I just thank you, God, that you are the healer, that you are the comforter, that you are the encourager, that you are our fortress, Just thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. I pray, Lord, for this assembly of people, our local body here at Cornerstone. There are many needs, and I just pray that you will meet every need according to your will. I thank you, Lord, for the food that's before us. As we partake meal after meal after meal, let us be reminded that you have provided it for us. Everything we have comes from you. May we use the strength from this meal to serve you and to glorify your name and to bear your image. I just thank you again for all that you are, all that you're doing and all that you yet will do. 
In Jesus' name, I pray. Let's all pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us 